you are sort of ensuring your own future by keeping parts of your product open source. You know, it's really hard to defend our choices without talking about it more and, and knowing why we're making those choices. It's kind of like a, a safety blanket for people that are wanting to try it. If we want people to be able to try and experiment with our tools for free, we don't have to run free versions of our software at a loss to be able to do that. We can just give them the code and tell them to go run it wherever they like. Hi, I'm Steve. And I'm David, and you're listening to Don't Make Me Code, the bi-weekly series where we discuss developer experience and some of the unique challenges we face building developer-facing products. Don't Make Me Code is brought to you by Heavybit, a nine-month program for developer-facing startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. And if you're interested in being a guest on this show or if you have a specific topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us at dmmc at heavybit.com or on Twitter at Don't Make Me Code. This episode is actually inspired by Matthias Lubkin. He reached out to us on Twitter and suggested that we talk about all the different kinds of developers that are using DevTools and the different ways that we design those tools for them. So we came up with a whole bunch of different ways of slicing up this market. You know, developers are not one and the same, and we've got developers in different roles, like front end versus back end, or dev and ops, and even management versus the makers. And we have different kinds of tools. We have SaaS products and open source products, and startup products and enterprise products, and we make totally different considerations for all those different vectors. So we're going to try to unpack all of those today. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's we could start with just you know why is this even important to to think about at all? You know why why do we need to care who you know what kind of developer is using our product? Like, do we design things differently from them? Do we price things differently for them? You know, it's sort of you know how do we actually think about these developers? And yeah, it's funny that in the moment we're not necessarily thinking about all the different slices of developers. You know, we're thinking about our slice. Who are the exact users that we're targeting and why? And I think you know, for both of us, it's just that a having been around a while, we've seen a few of these different vectors, and and b, it's just interesting to talk about all the different things that we've seen in these spaces. And I think talking about it helps us back up our decisions too. That you know, we're we're both building products for what I would say is a similar market segment, but you know, it's really hard to defend our choices without talking about it more and, and knowing why we're making those choices. So I think it, it will be interesting to unpack a lot of this and, and figure out why we're doing what we do. At least with us, we're seeing relatively small companies are kind of the early adopters. Are, are you seeing something similar? Yeah, I mean, so we definitely, you know, we're still pretty early on in, in building our product. And you know, of course, you know, the first people that come to to start to use some of these things are sort of your early adopter types, you know, kind of the the hacker mindset generally tend to be from you know smaller companies or or kind of new in their projects. You know, this is you know, sort of a, a greenfield operation or something. We tend to see people like that more willing to try sort of what you would consider ex- experimental or new technology. Yeah, we're certainly seeing a lot of that too. I think a lot of earlier adopters are at smaller companies just because they're the ones that are willing to experiment. And you know, for all of us, of course, a big challenge is getting to those bigger customers who have more stable needs and who have more money and who are going to be long-term customers. And for us, that's really been dominant in what we've seen early. The people that we approach, the people who like our product the most tend to be from these small companies who are willing to experiment and who are also on the bleeding edge of technology. But it sounds like you guys at Convox are seeing something a bit different. You know, we started off seeing a lot smaller companies, but you know, we've actually now started to see actually some quite larger organizations be interested in our stuff. Actually, attribute a lot of that to the open source nature of you know our core platform. People are a lot more willing to to both try it. They're less worried that we will just vanish and go away. And they they basically it's kind of like a, a safety blanket for people that are wanting to try it. That's really interesting. That because your product has an open source component to it, you're seeing big customers approach you as well. Because you know we're just a SaaS product, and so that might be more of a barrier to entry, especially for larger companies and. That's an interesting gateway. Like with you know with SaaS products, you're targeting a very clear customer set. You're making a lot of assumptions and decisions about who that customer is. But with open source, you've got a product that a might be more configurable and b might serve a much wider audience. And so, do you think that that's why you're getting these uh, approaches from larger companies too? I think so. Um, you know, certainly, the ability to to customize it to suit your own needs is is pretty. Uh 
attractive, especially if you know you're a larger company and you have some of your own developers or ops people on payroll that can kind of you know work on this stuff. They they like to be able to get their hands into it. But yeah, I think definitely just you know as we've started to to engage bigger and bigger companies, you know we get a lot more questions about like how long have you been around and how big are you <laughs> and, and will you be here next year. And so, you know, being able to give, you know, both references from our early customers, but also just, hey, it's open source, you know, it's, you can just keep running it if, if we were to go away is, is really important. Yeah, that's interesting too, that, you know, there are a few different vectors here, like open source versus SaaS that, that are, are just funny to talk about, that with open source, I feel like a big part of the way you design the product is around customization. You know it's going to be serving a wide audience, and so you have to leave that door open for people to, to tailor it to their needs, and that you're designing it with that in mind versus a SaaS product where you're almost doing the opposite. You're making a lot of decisions up front and a lot of assumptions and trying to kind of refine all of the workflows and all of the design aspects of the product around a narrower set of use cases. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And sort of, I mean, that's kind of fundamental to the reason that we actually decided to go both routes to a certain extent is that the open source is you know, very available, people can use it, they can customize it, and then we've built some sort of opinionated you know, workflows and integrations and things like that as a SaaS on top of that. So we can kind of you know, give both, both a nice experience for people that want that or you know, the crazy Swiss Army knife experience for people that want that. Yeah, I think it's really funny what you said too about reassuring larger customers that you'll be there, that the open source component of the software lives on when a SaaS can't make that promise, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit scary to talk about. Certainly in our space, there's this interesting life cycle of companies on both sides, SaaS and open source, where if a SaaS company gets acquired, you'll sometimes see the product just die. The acquiring company might in fact be buying that company to kill the competitor. Yeah, I mean, I guess that actually goes to show it doesn't really matter what size the company backing up the product is, right? You know, Facebook and Google kill products all the time, so... Yeah, and for them, like with Parse, they made the acquisition and I guess decided they wanted parts of the product to live on even if it wasn't profitable for them, so they open sourced it. As a company founder talking about the creation of software that will hopefully live as long a life as possible, I think the open source design aspect is interesting too because you are sort of ensuring your own future by keeping parts of your product open source. Then that no matter what happens to the company and to the software, You've got this piece that can live on. Where, unfortunately, with a lot of SaaS products, your best case scenario might be an acquisition in which your product just gets rolled up into something larger or lost forever. Yeah, it's certainly interesting. I mean, the open source angle also gives us, you know, if we want people to be able to try and experiment with our tools for free, we don't have to run. You know, free versions of our software at a loss to be able to do that. We can just give them the code and tell them to go run it wherever they like. Yeah, and you let them deploy it internally, and the the expense and the time are, are on them. And yeah, that's a nice compromise. Actually, try it out for free. But if you want a better, more polished experience, and you want us to host it, then you pay us some money. Mm-hmm. I also think it's really interesting to talk about the different kinds of products we design for small companies and startups versus enterprises. Like the last company I worked at was in the configuration management space. And so we found a market niche in more middle tier companies. And it wasn't on the bleeding edge of technology at all. In fact, we were starting a new company to cater to companies that had been around a while who were new to configuration management versus what I'm working on now, which is very much on the bleeding edge of technology. Microservices, AWS architecture, and auto scaling, like we make all of these assumptions. And because of that, we're very biased towards companies that have these newer stacks and, and are either newer or have just recently migrated to that stack. And it sounds like you've got a bit of both there as well because of the open source component. Yeah, I'm actually curious. You know, when you say you were dealing with, you know, I guess, sort of like older, more mature companies at your last company, did you, do you still find that it's, or is it developers coming to you kind of? Looking for your product, or is it is it other people inside the company? Yeah, that's been an interesting one too. Because the last few companies I've worked at have all been monitoring companies, and over these last few years, there has been this pretty dramatic shift in roles, where jobs formerly done by full time operations people are now being done by developers and people with DevOps in their title. And so things like deploying infrastructure and monitoring these are being done by devs now, when they were they were formerly firmly in the realm of operations. Are you seeing similar things at Convox? Um, I mean, definitely. You know, basically everybody that comes to us right now is a developer. You know, they have an application. They generally have a rough idea of, of how they want to get it on the internet. You know, 
we're still seeing a lot of early adopters, you know, Docker enthusiasts and, and sort of, you know, cutting edge tech enthusiasts and and yeah, I mean they're they definitely just want to dive right in and, and kind of crack it open and get get working. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you can like carbon date a company by the tech stack they're using. You, they tell you what software they're built on. They tell you how their infrastructure is set up, and you can almost put an age on it. Uh, if not on the software itself, maybe on the people at the company, uh, because it speaks very much to the kinds of decisions that are made. Among startups, technology choices are almost flippant. Like they can change monthly, and it's kind of crazy. Actually, you might be dealing with one JavaScript framework one month, and then a different one the next month, and you, as a company trying to keep pace. Are forced to follow these trends like fashion and make sure you're not getting left behind. Where it feels like when you're dealing with bigger companies, those choices are more stable. Yeah, I mean, so you know, you're exactly right about that. So we try and do a lot of automation around you know detecting what kind of technology you're using and and building things for you automatically. So it, it's definitely been a treadmill of you know what what JavaScript framework or what you know Rails 4.1 does this week. I mean, it's just sort of part of trying to make that that onboarding experience as nice as possible. But it, it certainly is, you know, takes time and effort to keep up with it. Yeah, and with bigger companies, there are other priorities that you might not even think about for startups, like single sign-on and SAML login, mm-hmm. where you might be devoting less time to keeping up with technology trends, but more time to the kinds of customizations that big companies need. Like we have a shared sign-on login system for everyone at the company, so it makes it easier to onboard new people. And the dreaded question of when we need to support Windows. <laughs> I mean, like us, because we're focusing so much on these younger companies who are able to move quickly and make decisions quickly, we have this grassroots onboarding process. You give us a username and password, you give us your Amazon keys, and you're good to go. We try to onboard you in two minutes versus a larger deployment of something more sophisticated, you might spend weeks customizing an open source tool to get exactly the right configuration you want and to tailor it to your environment. But once you've got that, it's now an extension of your organization and your team, and you're you're set for a while. Yeah, I mean, so you know, we we definitely tend to have developers be the people that come to us at first, at least. You know, we're trying to experiment with the product, see if it's going to work for them, and we. We spend a lot of time thinking about how to make sure that like everything that they learn through that experimentation process is actually valuable knowledge to actually bring the thing into their company and, and make it work you know, in production for real things. So it's definitely you know trying to make everything as, as easy and seamless as possible, but also making sure that we kind of like give them little nuggets of knowledge along the way that are going to help. Yeah, that's true. Like we talked about last time, there's this really frustrating part of onboarding users into any DevTools product, which is they might try you out in staging, or they might try you out in ways that really aren't production configurations, and you want to make sure you're not wasting their time by having them have to start all over. It's also interesting, even the sales and marketing process that it's still a common practice with enterprise tools to have mystery around your product, to describe in rough terms what it's for, but to have a link to contact sales. And on the one hand, it can seem underhanded, but it also seems to have a pretty clear goal in mind that a big company making a decision like that about what software to use, they may have already made the decision by the time they're visiting you and so they're just looking for contact information and this is not something I'm an expert in so I have trouble talking about it and I don't know if you've dealt with enterprise software sales or, or anything like that before but with the grassroots process it's it's much more about transparency and, and automation like get people in, get them to try the product, get them to put in their credit card number versus you're dealing with a manager so get them to a salesperson. I kind of have a yeah, mixed feelings about that because I mean, every time I see one of those buttons on a website, it's very frustrating. Personally, I'm like, I just want to know how much it costs. Like, this is a huge, you know, part of my decision making process. Yeah, and yeah. especially, I wish companies would be clear about who their target customers were. And maybe, maybe this is my fault, but we were trying to sign up for this video chat app, Blue Jeans, and. I couldn't get pricing on their website. And I foolishly thought, okay, I'll enter my email address, I'll have somebody reach out to me, maybe we'll actually be able to use this. Well, it turned out their uh, cheapest pricing was something like $500 a month. For a company of six people at that time, that was a non-starter. And I felt like we both wasted our time. The salesperson wasted half an hour talking to me and trying to sell to me, and I wasted half an hour of my time that could have been better spent writing code. And yeah, it is confusing and frustrating because you know clearly I'm not their target customer but if they just told me that we could save each other a lot of time <laughs> the thing that's most interesting about 
enterprise sales and the fact that a large company might have already made a decision about software before they're even approaching you to discuss terms, that says something about how the company got there. That the inertia that you might have spent years building up to even get this company to know your name, you get there through the grassroots system. You you get developers to love the product. You get them to onboard. And it's only after you've earned it that some dev manager at Big Co will even like call you on the phone. Yeah, I mean definitely. But I, I feel, you know, having been that developer before, I, I feel like it's really hard to start to adopt new technology if, if the pricing is a mystery. So yeah, you know, even before I'm gonna take something to my manager, say in that situation, yeah, you know, I'm gonna wanna ask them or tell them how much it costs. Yeah, so this is this is fun and interesting. So on Twilio's homepage, they actually do a pretty good job of describing the product, of introducing pricing, and of actually giving you access to their tools to start using the product so that if you're an engineer, you can experiment. But they also have a link on their homepage that literally says, not a developer, question mark, and there's a link to sales. And so that seems like a really fun, if not tongue-in-cheek, way of saying, like, here, here's all of our stuff for you, the developer, but if you are a manager, we're just going to short-circuit you right into a salesperson. Yeah, I, mean, I actually think that's brilliant. It's you know, like you mentioned before, like let somebody know exactly you know who you're targeting with you know, something, you know, a specific message or whatever. It's you know, if I can come in here and you know, there's a button that you know, I immediately identify with. That's great. Yeah, I think the funny thing is like the recognition that if you're not a developer, you might actually need to speak with someone to get the information you need, and it's not insulting. It's helpful. It's you know they're trying to put a, a positive spin on it and trying to get everyone what they need. We also, as a monitoring company, look at lots of other monitoring tools when we're doing our precedent research and trying to figure out the competition. And we naturally end up looking at front end versus back end tools and and the way that we tailor those tools to those users. And comparing a front end tool like Sentry or uh, Skylight, those have a lot of visual polish and they have nice clicky UIs that help you through things visually versus a back end tool which might look totally different. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, it's almost hard to even bucket people as to which of those types of things they're going to prefer. Are they going to like you know the the clicky UI? Or are they going to like the back end CLI? It's almost like a it's a Venn versus Emacs kind of problem almost at its core. So it's it's certainly interesting to think about. Yeah, and it's funny that you know, developer experience design a few years ago was synonymous with API design. It was how are you creating your API endpoints in a way that's friendly and consistent and consumable and it just assumed the term developer experience assumed you were typing something into a command line or inter- interacting with an API and now you know we're both dealing with a space that's developer tools but definitely not necessarily a command line and so there's a whole world now of of ways that we try to get developers to use our our stuff and and how we get them to make our tools part of their daily work life but there is still the consideration of who the end user is and what they're looking for, and whether they want a CLI or not is one of those things. And and it's a very conscious decision. Like if you're making a CLI, you need to have a clear idea of who's going to be using it and why. Mm-hmm. Like some of us, myself being a designer, might make the incorrect assumption that people just want a UI, like a nice clean UI is going to get the job done better every time. But that is absolutely not true. And you know, I think at least from my experience working with developers. They can get things done really fast with a command line and with the right uh, with the right API documentation. Yeah. Yes, uh, and not only like getting things done fast, but it's also you know the ability to include. You know, if I ship a CLI, now people can include that in their own scripts and automation and sort of build other things around it. And and uh, that's you know, I basically get a lot of leverage out of my command line by you know kind of taking all of these repeatable tasks and you know building other workflows out of them. And so. If you have the CLI, you can do that. If you have a web UI, it's you know, it's tough. To actually, you know, I guess I could technically script a whole bunch of web interactions, but it's it's a way different experience. Yeah, totally. And like a you know really good documentation with boilerplate code that you can just copy and paste, and you know making API keys available to people as part of the documentation, so that you can make this whole process seamless for people. And yeah, it's not only good design practice for engineers, but a great way of getting people to understand your tools more quickly and get started using them. I mean, there are certainly just certain tasks that lend themselves more to you know a graphical graphical experience than you know if I want to look at dashboards of my metrics or something. I guess I could technically render that in text at a CLI, but it's going to be way less useful. 
I'm sitting here looking at the GitHub project page for an ASCII terminal dashboard, <laughs> and I'm not really sure what to say about it because I can't tell if this is filling a need for anyone. It doesn't seem like anyone would be searching out for an ASCII dashboard. <laughs> but for a developer who spends their entire life in Emacs or in front of a bash prompt, like maybe there's a market for this that I don't really understand. I mean, I guess that could certainly be useful at a high level, but you know, for our dashboards, I love being able to drill into data or kind of, you know, sort of the interactivity of the, like the web is a lot more useful to me for, for that kind of thing. If nothing else, it calls attention to the way developers like to play with their tools and that if you give them a CLI and the right set of APIs to build a dashboard out of raw data, one of the things they might do is build an ASCII terminal inside of Emacs. <laughs> and another interesting thing about the way we build UIs, and, and for, for me, it somehow is through the lens of company size, but the way we present data and summarize data that at previous companies I've worked at, we've built dashboards, quote unquote, but they serve very different purposes for small companies versus big companies. That the way you summarize data to a company with 250 employees and a full engineering team versus a you know a handful of engineers in a room that you present things to them very differently like for a small company you might be able to just give them a list of servers in their environment or something and give them a tool if one of those servers is broken to restart it or fix it but for a big company who might have 200 servers doing that same job if 10% of them are down not only might they not care, they might actually have some kind of automation in place to take care of that for them. And so they're going to be looking at different metrics, like health as a percentage of total, something where I'm not concerned with individual entities, but I'm concerned with trends. And so that is an interesting thing too, the way we graph things, the way we summarize things, and how we present things. Um, you know, It really depends on the goals of the user we have in mind. So I guess I'm curious with uh, Opsy, the people that are actually you know viewing the monitoring or viewing these dashboards are the are they mostly developers also or do you tend to have people sort of in the, the higher echelons of management that are interested in this? In our well? case, almost everyone we've spoken to has been either a developer on the ground or the manager of a relatively small team who might actually still be writing code themselves. And yeah, so for for our purposes, though we do try to wrap things up in summaries, we still try to make it as easy as possible to get to an individual entity that might be causing them problems, like a server or something, and to give them quick access to that. Um, but yeah, at, at Convox, it sounds like you've got a bit of both, and I wonder you know, if, you, if you've taken some more care about summaries or, or other things that you would do for, for, larger, peop- for larger customers or managers. Uh, I mean, that's certainly, I guess, on our roadmap. But I mean, right now, basically, our entire tool is, is geared straight towards developers and you know, just getting their projects you know, onto the internet, managing them once they're there, monitoring them. You know, it's sort of, yeah, we don't really have any sort of the executive summary view yet. Like, and I think that speaks to the stages that our companies are at too, that you know, we're just both trying to get off the ground right now. And so it's very utilitarian. Like, Get the people on the ground what they need to start using the tool, and at least you know, at other, yeah, at other companies I've worked at as well, those kinds of executive functions do get built in later when you start to realize, okay, we have a real product now, we have a solid base of users, we can start to invest more time and energy in executive functions and the kinds of things that bigger companies will want because they take time too, and it, it's. It's not a deviation from core functionality. It's just that I don't think you can do those things until you figure out if you even have a product to build them on top of. Mm-hmm. And I think it also starts to happen naturally. You know, you get bigger and bigger customers, and now the people with the purse strings have have different, you know, different needs and different wants. And you know, you're basically trying to make your customer successful, right? So, if, you know, if the person you're trying to make successful now needs, you know, the the, the bird's eye view of everything, then you, know, you start naturally. Tr- Drifting towards making that kind of stuff. Yeah, totally. That when you're selling to a dev team and specifically talking to a manager, that manager is probably going to have their own interests at heart as well. And so you want to be able to give them something where they can find value in the product and not just their team. Mm-hmm. Thanks again to Matthias for sending in the question. It was uh, it was pretty interesting to sit here and kind of unpack some of the different kinds of you know, roles that or you know, types of people that that use our products. That's about all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you have a DX topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us at dmmc at heavybit.com or on Twitter at don't make me code. 
To learn more about HeavyBit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out the library. It's packed with amazing talks from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders.